Welcome to the ICLR Friday Forum for October 21st, 2022. This is one in a monthly uh, webinar series hosted by ICLR, the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction, Canada's leading source for disaster resilience knowledge. I'm your host, Dr. Keith Porter, ICLR Chief Engineer. Last month, we brought you two talks, one by Dr. Jen Beverly about wildfire pathways, the other by Drs. Julian Brimlow and Greg Kopp, about this year's record-breaking hail season in Western Alberta. Next month, on, October, on November 18th, uh, Julius Gombos will tell us about nature-based flood protection on Toronto's waterfront. But today, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Drs. Melanie Gall, Carol Friedland, and Christopher Emmerich, who will speak about Hazard Aware, a website that brings hazard, risk, and mitigation information to public and community decision makers. People have wondered for decades whether better disclosure of risk information could make natural hazard risk more of a market force and lead to better decisions. But to find out, first we need good mechanisms to frame and present that information. I'm keen to see uh, how our speakers today have uh, addressed that problem. Let me introduce our speakers. Uh, Dr. Gall is an assistant professor at Arizona State University in the School of Public Affairs, where she co-directs the Center for Emergency Management and Homeland Security, and manages the Spatial Hazard Events and Loss Database for the United States, Sheldis. Uh, Dr. Friedland is the Louisiana State University Ag Center La House Resource Center Director, and she's an Associate Prof Professor in Biological and Agricultural Engineering at the LSA Ag Center. Dr. Emmerich is an Endowed Professor of Environmental Science and Public Administration within the School of Public Administration, and a founding member of the National Center for Integrated Coastal Research at the University of Central Florida. He's speaking to us today from the Fort Myers, Cape Coral, uh, from Fort Myers, Cape Coral area. He's collecting flood data from Hurricane Ian, which made landfall late last month. But first, here's our agenda. Our webinar will last 90 minutes. Our speakers will present for about half of that time, and then I will moderate Q&A for the rest of the time. Please feel free to chat your questions into the Q&A box at any time. And then uh, when we come around to questions and answers, I will try to pose your questions in the order that they appear in the Q&A box. If we have a lot of questions, I may only pose your first question, then I'll move on to others, then I'll circle back to your additional questions. Our webinar is recorded. ICLR will post our speaker's slides and a link to the video on Monday or so. So if you have colleagues who couldn't attend, please let them know. Now, uh, Melanie, Carol, and Christopher, thanks so much for speaking with us today. Over to you. Thank you so much, Keith. Thank you so much for the invitation by you and ICLR, and we're excited to share our work with you. So let me go ahead and share the slides. Here we go. As Keith mentioned, what we're going to share today is one output of a larger research project that we're working on. It's an application called Hazard Aware. And the intent of this application, this website, is really to provide access, better access, and democratize the information that lives in all these various places, the information on hazards and risk and possibly what you could do to mitigate your home. In this presentation, we'll touch on four main areas. One, sort of the background, you know, where does Hazard Aware fit in in our larger research effort, and then subsequently really hone in on the application. And we will discuss four key elements of the application. There's a property summary, and we'll go with the different elements of the property summary. The area where we, dis where we share more information, we call it Know Your Risk. There's another information, another area called Be Risk Ready and learn more. We go step by step through these areas. And some key features that we want to highlight, especially in this presentation, is the mitigation calculator and how we get to our hazard ready score, which you see in the top right corner of these graphics here on the right hand side. And then we also want to share the pains, the aches, the joys of the process and sort of what we learned throughout the process, what were some of the research challenges and where we see the application going in the next steps. So where, um, what's sort of the background for this project and the impetus? And I, I wanna go back even a step further than what I have on the slides. 
mainly a, a very practical step because Carol, Chris, I, and the rest of our research colleagues, we are not just research colleagues, many of us are also personal friends. And so when we are in the process, or some of us were in the process of buying homes, we like we lamented constantly the fact that there is no information to be had anywhere. So we came from a very practical point of view where we said, okay, we want this information. And we, who are researchers already in this field, we can go step-by-step step to the different places and kind of cobble this information together. But what about people who don't have that knowledge or that background? And that was really for us sort of this personal uh, starting point to come up with this idea. And I also wanna say it didn't take us just one application to the various funding agencies. So we stayed persistent and submitted it a few times and then finally got funded. So the intent is really, or the audience that we're focusing on is the general public. This is not meant as, you know, a scientific communication tool or anything like this. We really wanna synthesize scientific information and communicate it in a way that's understandable to the general public. We want to inform residents, so that's both homeowners as well as home buyers and renters about past, present, and future risk levels. And in addition to just sharing information, we also want to provide actionable information. What can people do to mitigate against these hazards, particularly when they own a property, what can they do to protect their belongings? And most likely uh, their most important investment, their, their property. Information that we use and that we provide is both at the address level and the community level. And that's also one of the challenges that we're getting into later on. It's this, how do you straddle constantly this, this border of having community level information versus address level information? Our study area is on the Gulf Coast region. You see that little graphic that highlights the counties and the parishes in the US Gulf Coast. We have, we cover 119 six counties. We include information on 15 hazards and that uh, sums to 13.3 million addresses that we're dealing with. As I mentioned before, this application is an outgrowth of a project funded by the National Academies of Sciences Gulf Research Program which also uh, is the reason why our study area at this point is limited to the Gulf Coast. It's something we would like to expand to the whole US, but for this initial application, we focused on the Gulf Coast region. We are a team of more than 25 co-PIs, numerous postdocs, graduate students, and undergrads. So this is a large project that involves nine universities and research organizations. And as I mentioned, the intent for us is really make this, to make this information accessible uh, to the general public. The project, the call under which we had applied to the National Academies of Golf, uh, Golf National Academies Golf Research Program was actually a synthesis call for proposal, which is something rather unusual that you don't see in a lot of funding agencies. So the call was really designed, A, for us on what we intended to do, but B, the goal was to bring existing information together and create a, I don't want to say instantly, but quickly a beneficial output of this funding stream. So really the goal was synthesized and translated into something useful to the community. So as part of this project, we really heavily relied on the science in the risk communication realm and then synthesized information that exists on community resilience, social vulnerability, average annual losses, and then amortization of residential mitigation actions along with future risk information, specifically sea level rise and flood risk. So let's actually get into hazard aware and what is it? So here's a screenshot, and I apologize for sharing screenshots with you, but we did not wanna get um, into uh, possibly technologically fraud live presentation of the application. So if you're interested in the live application, you can um, go to hazardaware.org and type in an address. For instance, what you see here on the top portion, once you type in the address, this is the landing page, uh, the project summary information. And the four key elements that I'm going to showcase in this presentation are these tabs that you see here on the top portion. Property summary, know your risk, know your community, be risk ready. 
So it's intended in a sort of linear fashion to guide the user of the application to start with a general overview and then allow them to dive deeper, hoping they want to dive deeper, but we did not overwhelm the, the user with too much information all at once. So in this property summary, there are some elements uh, that I'd like to highlight. One is the score. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we do this in a, in a second. But I think to us, one of the reasons why we include the score and where the score is very different from some of the scoring features you can see on uh, real estate websites nowadays, like Zillow and, and Redfin in the US, they tend to provide a score for the hazard risk. Ours is really tied to the property. It's where we are trying to combine both the community level information that we have with information that we have on the property. So we don't wanna leave it to the end user to assume or conclude, derive on their own, what these different hazard risks mean for them and the property. So we really try to score the individual properties in terms of how resilient these properties are. So the score is a mechanism for us to bridge both the community level information with the building information. We also provide annualized hazard costs. You see this here on the, on the top right corner. We show the top three hazards by loss, and we show the loss in dollar amounts because we concluded based on the, the literature that we think dollar numbers is one of the most easily interpretable unit. People can quickly put that in context. And we provide average loss for the property on an annual basis, as well as for five years and 30, year, 30 years. We also provide here down at the bottom right, there's a screenshot, uh, a comparison of the property losses to the community, to the zip code, to the county, to the state. So as a mechanism to contextualize how, many, uh, how much loss has this um, location experience compared to others, because we were assuming uh, especially if you're maybe a renter or a home buyer, that you are looking into different areas. You're looking at different properties and you might want to compare these properties based also on their, on their risk profile and their loss profile. So this is where we want to give an in, initial uh, comparative analysis. Then we include present and future flood risk. It's not shown here on the screen. You would have to scroll down further uh, on the website. And there's also a property report that the end user can download, where all this information then um, shows up in a PDF for the end user to keep. Uh, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Carol, who's gonna talk a little bit more about the average annual losses and how she actually calculated them. Thanks, Melanie. Um, so for the average annual losses, one of the things that we really wanted to be able to demonstrate to the users of the tool is how much loss we estimate has happened in small geographical areas throughout history. So using the historical loss databases that Melanie maintains at Arizona State, uh, the Sheldis loss database, we were able to download all of the per capita losses for six different hazards, for uh, tornado, hail, lightning, wildfire, extreme cold, and severe thunderstorm. So I just want to say, uh, given our Canadian audience here, our extreme cold in the Gulf Coast area is not the same as your extreme cold, um, but it is like those of us in Louisiana during January when we go outside and it's 40, which is pretty warm, but we don't have a coat on. So it makes it be very cold. Um, a lot of our homes are uh, very subject to damage, uh, pipes freezing because they're not adequately in insulated. Um, and other types of damage when we have those, those cold events, ice storms, things of that nature. So um, I had given a presentation in Michigan last week and I mentioned the extreme cold and there was some uh, laughing about that for the Gulf Coast area. Uh, what we did is we also downloaded the uh, hazard intensity information from uh, the different uh, government agency websites that house that long-term hazard data. and. Uh, we used uh, GIS to uh, basically come up with average annual probabilities of, I'm sorry, annual probabilities of those hazards occurring 
And then we took the loss information from Sheldus and we weighted it by the probability of that hazard over the period of time that we analyzed along with the population of that census block and then divided that by the sum of the product of the population and the hazard intensity. So essentially what we were trying to do is to take this county level data that we got from Sheldus and weight it by both the hazard intensity and the population and then normalize it across this, the parish or the county study area to be representative of what we anticipate its contribution to the whole is. So hopefully that's kind of understandable. And then from that, uh, what we have is what the average annual loss would be um, for each of those different hazards. And as you can see in this picture here, uh, a pretty fine spatial resolution um, and really trying to represent that more of the, the loss would occur where those population centers are greater and then also um, distributed by where the hazards most likely occurred. Next slide. Thank you, Carol. And Carol also touched on a point that will come up repeatedly through this presentation is the downscaling of information, the scale at which information is available, and then how we had to um, standardize data, downscale data in order to synthesize all, the diff all these different data streams. As I mentioned earlier, I started with the summary overview, the landing page, and when an end user types in the information. And so now I would like to switch over to the know your risk um, piece of uh, the website. And here we get more into detail about the specific hazard types, the various hazard types, because as you saw on the overview page, we only mentioned the top three loss causing hazards. But then here in this know your risk space, the end user can see the set of hazards that actually affect the community. And here we then also share information about how often does this type of hazard occur? What kind of historic losses has this hazard caused? Again, some of the shieldless data that Carol used for the average annual losses will be displayed here on this website. But then it also got us thinking, you know, for an end user providing frequencies and historic losses, is information, but how can they actually translate this information into a sense of what does this mean for me? Because otherwise it's it's solely descriptive when we say this is how often something happens and these were the losses caused in the past. And we know from research that there is um, a tendency in the general public to, I don't want to say rely, but sort of think about backstops and think about these backstops like insurance, maybe federal assistance that might be provided after disaster without having any awareness of how much this assistance might be or these insurance payouts and that there's a high chance that they are not made whole after an event. And this is why we included information on this page that shows the end user, for instance, what is the average flood insurance claim that gets paid out for this area. And you see here in this example, if you recall, we had a very low resilience score. So there was sub, uh, substantial risk for the home and the homeowner or the renter of that property. But on average, this you or residents, flood insured residents in this area go only got $381 paid out for the insurance claims. And However, there were substantial numbers of insurance claims filed, 164,000. So clearly there is a high flood risk in this area. And then as a whole, uh, more than $62 million had been paid out in flood insurance. So we just wanna give the, the end user a sense for you know, where they might fall within possible insurance payouts based on the information that's publicly available through FEMA. Then also we wanted to kind of dispel some of these um, known myths or assumptions that people have about you know, how easily it is, how easy it is to get federal assistance. So this is why we included the rejection rate 
by FEMA for homeowners insist, uh, assistance as well as renters assistance. So you see clearly here, more than half of the applications got denied in this area. And you also get an average of how uh, much FEMA paid to the applicant, which is also not very much. And what you will see repeatedly in this application, we tend to not only provide the numerical information, but then also simply spell it out in a sentence of what that means uh, for the end user. The third uh, element of uh, hazard aware is this know your community. So we've transitioned from the summary to the hazard profile, and now we're getting more into the maybe demographics of a community, as you will, the pre-existing uh, conditions within a community. And this is where we share, for instance, information on uh, the social vulnerability information for the community. And when I say community, in this case, it's the, the census block. So it's not the community or the city as a whole. So it's the block level information. So for us, that's the finest unit of analysis is the block. When we have um, these large data sets like social vulnerability, which is uh, Susan Cutter's um, SOVI index or community resilience, which is an index, the baseline resilience indicators for community. Then we also include environmental vulnerability information um, summarized as the environmental vulnerability index. And I wanna point out that while we use all these indices, again, I wanna remind you, the goal of this project was to synthesize existing data sets. And so we drew on these eight because Chris Emmerich, he's the master of all things social vulnerability, brought that to the table. Susan Cutter is part of the research team. She brought Brick to the table. Then we have environmental vulnerability. Christy Lewis, Lewis another uh, co-PI of this project, developed the EVI. And none of these indices have uh, overlapping or duplicate information. So it's not that one index measures something that's already contained in this other index. So these indices are completely you know, um, exclusive of each other. We also, as I mentioned, we try to straddle and across this border boundary between community level information and the home itself. And one way we do this is by, um, this is where we had to get into developing our own data, looking at the building code that was in fact at time of construction and then how this building code changed over time in the various jurisdictions within our study area. Then we also include information um, in the US, the National Flood Insurance Program uh, offers the community uh, rating systems, which allows communities when they participate in the community rating system to wholesale collectively for all the residents within the community to get discounts. So the more the community does in terms of flood reduction and flood mitigation, the more discounts a community can get, meaning the rating gets higher, as you see on the right-hand side. So the lowest class a community can be in in the community rating system is a class 10, no discounts. And then you can go all the way up to a class one, which I think in the US, I don't know, Carol, Chris, maybe you recall, I think there might be two or three, if at all. I think two or three communities in the nation that have such a high uh, rating. And such a high uh, rating in the community rating system then provides discounts, insurance premium discounts for all the residents who purchase flood insurance. And I think that's also um, something that many residents are simply not aware of, that as a whole, uh, their um, planners or flood managers can actually proactively do something that affects people's pockets books by having to pay uh, less flood insurance premiums or lower flood insurance premiums. Then the fourth element, so we went from the insure, from the property summary to a background information on the hazards profile to information on the community, and then be risk ready. This last piece of hazard aware provides more information on, I, I wanna say maybe educational information where we present various mitigation options, explain them. We provide uh, sort of contact information for local advocacy groups and organization, as well as nationwide groups. And we also have a mitigation calculator, which I think is one of the fantastic features of uh, Hazard Aware, 
where it actually gives the end user an opportunity to play with some of the actions they might consider implementing, the mitigation actions they might consider implementing, and then allows them to get a sense for how long would it take actually for the costs of these mitigation actions to amortize over the length of the time they want to stay in this property. And Carol's going to speak more to this in a second. So as I mentioned, some of the key features are the mitigation calculator and the hazard score. And I'm going to kick it over to Carol, who's going to tell us more about the mitigation calculator. OK, so the bottom six hazards here, those are the ones we talked about before that are calculated using that average annual loss method. And so this property that I picked here is from uh, down in Florida uh, with very few of these other hazards. But you can see that the flood hazard and the wind hazard are the primary uh, issues that this property is dealing with. So the flood and the wind calculations for the risk is done in a different way than the other six hazards. Um, for these, we use um, looking at the wind first, the Hazus MH hurricane model, which is a uh, model developed by FEMA, and it's got a suite of loss functions for uh, housing types. And so we look at um, whether it's masonry or wood frame construction, if it has a hip or a gable roof, uh, some of the main mitigating components of home construction, which we'll see on the next slide. Um, and then we use the, the hazards functions to match homeowner input about their building to what the Hazus model would return in terms of loss. And then we give the mitigation options to the user and the ones that they select, it then matches to those wind loss functions and then compares the difference. So we're calculating kind of a pre-mitigated building condition with a post-mitigated building condition and showing them how much money uh, based on the Hazus wind model, it demonstrates that they would save. For the flood hazards, uh, we have used the um, First Street Foundation flood data um, to understand what uh, flood elevations or flood depths would be across multiple return periods. And we've developed a method that goes in and at individual home locations, samples those return period depth grids and fits a gumbel distribution for each individual location, um, which we then characterize basically the slope and intercept of that gumbel distribution line uh, when plotted on that logarithmic axis. And so what we have provided in terms of the, the web development is a database of these slope and intercept parameters all across the study area so that when the user selects their building, uh, they're getting the nearest uh, flood hazard slope and intercept. And then within the hazard aware tool itself, it's performing the integration of the loss function as a function of probability. Uh, for the loss functions, we're using the US Army Corps of Engineers loss function. And so truly for every building that's um, able to be queried by the tool, it is calculating a separate flood loss number that's based on uh, those different items. And so on the, the right-hand side, you can see it's adding up uh, the building loss, the contents loss. And so we have uh, separate functions for those, both in HAZUS and for the US Army Corps uh, depth damage functions. And then loss of use, we're using information both, again, from, from FEMA. Uh, I think actually only FEMA information from that. So calculating the amount of time people would be out of their homes after um, specific events, and we are doing that same sort of risk integration under those loss of use functions, and then adding that up in terms of their total annual loss or their total annual risk. Next slide, Mel. And so this is, if you step through the tool, um, so it does prompt you, you know, information about the home. And I think one of the things that we really focused on um, which kind of came to my mind when Melanie was showing the different scales is how we're communicating information to the users, because a lot of this is very complex and it requires 
knowledge of information that they truly don't know. So, you know, many people don't know what the framing type of their building is. They don't know the difference between a hip and a gable roof. Uh, and so we, we, as if you step through the calculator uh, as it is, it's got different pictures that show you, you know, what some of these things are so that to, to help guide that selection. Um, and so it, it's kind of interesting. I was talking with uh, somebody a couple of months ago and they were asking me, what do I think you need to know to be able to understand the wind resilience of a building? And, you know, after working on this project, truly, I think this is the list, right? Um, at least, you know, using the hazardous loss functions, um, but we're looking at, you know, what type of building is it? What is the square footage of the living area? Um, and I will note to calculate the loss costs and the, and the risk, we're using a uh, replacement cost multiplied by that square footage. So the replacement cost is basically a, a price per square foot uh, that is integrated within hazard aware on a zip code basis. And so that's pulled uh, depending where people live, how many stories there are, if the home is split level, if the entry is above ground or below ground, and then if it's uh, above or below ground, then how far is the threshold of their front door? So we're trying to get at that first floor elevation or where water could enter. And then if the building has a basement, what year the home was built, so that's automatically populated along with the square footage. We do have um, some of that information from uh, the Z tracks that is integrated into the site. And so it kind of can give users a sense of you know, comfort or, or some information that they may not know. Um, again, if that's not correct, then the user can change that information. What is the, the structure, the frame of the material? Does the building have storm shutters? Do you have an attached garage? And then if you click yes, you have an attached garage, then it asks if you have a standard or a reinforced garage door. Uh, the default is, is standard on that. Uh, what is the shape of the roof and is the roof fortified? So fortified is a program by the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, which um, you know, will dramatically reduce the uh, wind loss if you have a fortified roof. Uh, are you going to rent, do you rent or own, and then how long will you be in your building? And so from there, then you're presented with a, a couple different options in terms of flood mitigation and wind mitigation, and so you can select yes or no. And on the right-hand side, I'm showing the results, basically, of selecting that I want to elevate my house, uh, my existing home, which is actually quite expensive, and then also coming in and putting storm shutters and uh, installing an IVHS fortified roof. So you can see on the right side, the cost of that mitigation we estimate is about $158,000. Most of that is raising that existing home because that's very expensive. Um, but I think it's important as a mitigation technique and also a lot of times there are incentives or um, maybe post-disaster programs that'll help homeowners pay for some of those things. So one of the things that I really want to continue working on is um, some of the display of this payback period, for example, because different people are in different situations. Chris right now is down um, doing damage surveys in the aftermath of Hurricane Ian. And some of the things that we have kind of talked about is, you know, now is really the time to make the decision to make those upgrades, because if you go ahead and do all of your repairs, you put your house back in livable condition, very seldom do people decide, okay, now I'm going to go ahead and mitigate it. And a lot of the hurricanes that we've had in Louisiana, you know, over the past two years, people have put their, their house back into place and then they found out, oh, there's something more resilient they could have used. And the, the statement, I wish I had known that is is it's devastating to my ears, you know? So they say, I wish I had known I could have upgraded to something stronger. And so um, that's really something that I think really deserves a little bit more attention in terms of how we're presenting it on the site. And another opportunity is to look at the effects of insurance. So um, the flood insurance rating system in the US changed over the last two years. So that's not something that we've been able to integrate into this yet. And then some states do offer credits on insurance premiums 
for those fortified roofs. Um, so I think that we can do a little bit better in terms of um, how we're displaying this information because right now it looks like, oh, I need to cough up, you know, $160,000. Uh, that's not really realistic. So um, that's something we're going to continue to work on. Melanie? Thank you, Kara. I think Carol's work on the mitigation calculator also highlights one of the challenges is I easily, yeah, I stated, oh, we're just synthesizing information. It's really not that easy because yes, we, we tap into existing information and approaches, but then combining them is really where a lot of our brain effort had to go into. And then how do you communicate it and display it on the application is really an, an, an entirely separate work effort, especially if you are sort of more inclined to talk in a very sciencey way rather than straightforward thinking about the general public. So across the team, we've been educated and schooled many times. <laughs> so as I mentioned, the last piece here of the four key elements of hazard aware, we had property summary, know your risk, know your community. And here, the last piece is this educational component to our website, where for instance, we uh, provide more information on mitigation strategies, but we also include survivor testimony. And for instance, news pieces that we find, you know, stories that Carol had just mentioned, where for instance, there's a sort of bad news story, how, you know, people lost their homes, but we also have good news stories where a home, you know, withstood the onslaught of flood and, and winds as an example of how important it is, how well a home is constructed. We have examples, resilience examples, and then provide more information on specific hazards and a glossary. And we also included a home buyer and renters checklist because if you just do a quick, quick, quick Google and you look for a home buyer checklist, you find information on you know, check with your mortgage or get different quotes for getting a mortgage and all sorts of information, all sorts of things you should be doing, none of which has anything to do with the risk of the property, the area the property is located in. So we really like looked at what are sort of these standard checklists that are provided and what additional information do we think a renter, a home buyer should ask before they sign on the dotted line. Another feature aside of the from the mitigation calculator, I think that's pretty unique to our website is the score. And I think very different from all the other scores you currently see on these real estate websites. Carol mentioned that we use um, uh, flood factor data and we also use the CTREX data from Zillow as some of our key input data sets, but none of these application really considers what is, when was the home constructed? Under what building home was the property constructed? So they only give you really more community level regional information, nothing that's truly specific to the property, which I think makes, of course I'm biased, but which I think makes our application and product really, uh, I think much more beneficial for an end user. And so here the goal is really to synthesize various pieces of information, the community resilience information, social vulnerability information, environmental vulnerability information, average annual losses, and then consider the construction uh, quality of the home. So I just want to briefly go over the sort of uh, scale that we are using. So everything is scaled from zero to 100 because based on the research that we've done, um, we think that there is an sort of instant ability to interpret what these scores mean because everybody who's gone to school knows 100 is great in the US and, and zero is not so good. So we leaned on this and behind the scenes, everything is converted into percentile. So while we don't spell this out here that, you know, a 50 means, you know, you're in the 50th percentile, but this is really here on these different scales, what this means. Everything is scaled in percentiles. And what I think makes our application also slightly different is 
a strong driver of where a property lands in term of, terms of their score is the overall community resilience. And you'll see this in a second when I show you the formula. And then we use social vulnerability, environmental vulnerability, and average annual losses. We combine these sort of, you know, maybe detrimental factors to a property. And we average those out. And the hazard resilient construction piece, the way we're doing this is, and this is a shortcoming of our application, and this is where going forward, we want to really improve the exchange of information between the mitigation calculator, because this is where an end user can truly share information about their specific property and what we actually have access to through the ZTRAX data. Through the ZTRAX data, we know when the home was constructed and uh, what type of construction we're dealing with, but we have no idea if the home was remodeled, it was you know maybe remodeled to code, none of this. So this is why the information that you see here is essentially generated by default based on the information we have through the ZTRAX uh, information. And going forward, it would be really great if we can draw in or leverage more of the user provided information. But we did not want to do this right at the onset because you saw when Carol guides an end user through the different steps, those are a lot of steps. That's a lot of information. So we did not. Um, make or increase the threshold for an end user to get information on their property by asking them too many questions about their property. So the way we are constructing the score is, as I mentioned, we use BRIC, the building, uh, the baseline resilience indicators for communities, divide that by averaging out these adverse components, social vulnerability, average annual losses, and environmental vulnerability, and then multiplied by a housing factor that we've developed as part uh, of this project. And uh, I will you know, gladly disclose that the housing factor is really promoting homes that have been built, or sort of not promoting, but gives you a substantial increase in your hazard ready score if the home is constructed to uh, IBC 2015 or newer, International Building Code or International Res uh, Residential Code. And so we take into account the time of construction, what code was in effect at time of construction, and then what type of home are we looking at here? Is it a mobile home? Is it a residential home or engineered home? And through a combination of these characteristics, we've developed a housing factor to then uh, generate hazard, the final hazard ready score. So what have we learned in the process of this project? Uh, aside from you know, our individual susceptibility to headaches and migraines, uh, we learned that it's pretty, it's, it's really resource intensive to, even if you have data available, really combining these data sets in a meaningful way was time consuming, resource consuming, and then implementing that in an application where we were lucky through Chris, who at the University of Central Florida has a tremendous team of uh, programmers and web designers to help us translate that into a web application. So on our end as researchers, we really dealt with how do we harmonize the different data sets? How we do we deal with the different scales? For instance, um, Susan Cutter and her colleagues, she developed the BRIC index but that index prior to the start of our project only existed at the county level. And then she had to downscale that. And so what are the methods for that? You know, how can we use the same data for the county level index versus the now block level index that we've created? Then capturing the property specific details, as you saw with uh, Carol's mitigation calculator, we decided purposefully not to put that at the front end of the application because it might create a threshold for an end user to even access our website. So we've integrated in the mitigation calculator, but I think there is great potential for us going forward to then have that feedback into the property summary, which it currently doesn't. Then our application, I think is uh, a good example of what is called public information technology. So we developed this within a, a university setting, but now we also need to think about, we've got this initial funding for the implementation, but now we have to think about, you know, how do we maintain this? How do we really keep this alive and operational with the most current 
um, data sets that we have access to. Then, luckily, uh, I want to say um, Sonia Stevens, who is a co-PI on this project, She's from the English department, and that was really helpful. Might not be, you know, a person you might consider thinking about having on your research team, but we really needed somebody who is not as uh, sort of well versed in the technical details and the risk landscape, but who can really look at the information and think about is this understandable to the general public. And then we also had to. Let's, you know, for better, you know, choice of words, say we also had to lean a little bit more out the window than what you usually do as a researcher. We, to some degree, had to take a stance, you know, in, in terms of really interpreting our data and not use all the time too many, you know, woulds, coulds, shoulds, may, because we wanted to be very straightforward with the information that we're providing, because our intent is, with this application, is to change behavior. We want people to buy more hazard resilience homes, buy them, build them, rent them, and really disrupt sort of the business as usual that we're seeing here in the US. What has also been challenging, uh, our project started in uh, 2019. So we were right in the midst of uh, COVID. So our community outreach has not been um, as extensive as we would like to. But I think we still managed very successfully to uh, include a community voice because another uh, partner in this project, for example, uh, was Louisiana Sea Grant. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Sea Grant institutions here in the US, but they are essentially the science communicator, I want to say, between what a university or universities do. And then they have representatives in the various coastal counties and parishes. So they are very much in touch with what's happening on the ground and provide really a access to community partners and they can report back just based on their own experience, their everyday work experience. And that allowed us also not having to develop these community connections as a research team. So we were relying on trusted partners in this project. So what do we see as next steps for this project? So we're working on an API so that has a where it can be included uh, in other websites. We are working on modifying the hazard ready score based on the user provided property information. Uh, we're working on uh, improved feedback mechanism. And we're also currently actively working on aggregating the different pieces of information that we have to a more regional level. So right now the website is entirely designed and targeted to an let's say address-based end user, homeowner, home buyer, renter, but we wanna provide more um, regional level information. This could be a zip code, it could be a jurisdiction, a larger community to provide summary information of maybe, you know, how many properties at a certain, with a certain hazard ready score are, for instance, in the floodplain. So that maybe a local decision maker gets a quick overview and understanding of how many properties and what type of properties are at risk in their community and at risk to what types of hazards. So this is just an overview. As I mentioned before, we had nine universities, research centers, more than nine research centers and uh, universities involved in this project. Chris, who is on mute, and I'm sure he had to really fight the urge to unmute himself throughout this presentation and not jump in with additional comments, but I'm sure he's gonna sh say, share some of them. So Chris Emrick has been uh, really the driving force, leading hand PI of this project, and he's been you know, a, doing a phenomenal job. So with that, I would like to encourage you to visit our website, hazardaware.org, type in an address. You might be a little bit um, generous with your time, not generous with your time, but just patient for a minute because the address bar will populate. So as you type, as you start typing in an information, you will uh, see options for an address to pick. So you don't even have to be a resident of the Gulf Coast area or need to know an address to play with a website. You can just start typing three, two, and then wait, whichever address pops up, select an address, and then you actually have uh, information at your fingertips and on your computer display. So with that, Keith, thank you so much. And I don't know if Chris wants to say something before I close out and we switch over. Uh, Mel, Carol, thanks a lot. Uh, all, I am sorry that I was unable to present my portion, but we have 
I'm not sitting in a beautiful room in downtown Orlando. I'm sitting in a, a place that is just full of people as we're trying to uh, collect these perishable high watermark uh, data from Hurricane Ian. I have nothing to add. Um, I would value conversation with the group more than me blabbing on about something. So thanks a ton, everybody. Great, thank you so much uh, to our speakers. I'm going to, uh, we have, we have uh, a, a few questions. I have one or two of my own. I'm gonna start with um, uh, one by Chris uh, Chopek who says, outstanding work, congratulations. Have you considered connecting this to a relative real estate valuation or devaluation function? Uh, and parenthetically, from post-disaster hedonic regression studies on aggregate or similar. Uh, so basically, have you considered tying this to uh, dollars uh, of, of, of risk? Uh, dollars of risk, I think is what he means. In terms of the home value? I think that's what he means, a, a valuation or devaluation function. So we certainly um, have seen evidence of the fact that hazards are included in home values. Uh, one of the postdocs that's here with me has done some stuff on um, flooding and levees and the sort of reverse levee effect that although the levee is supposedly protecting you, home values behind levees are lower um, when, when all things are equalized to home values of similar homes that are not behind levees. So we think that the value, that the hazards are being somehow included in the value of homes. Um, and we do plan on, as we finish our, our third year, as Mel had said, is really going to be about um, developing sort of aggregations. So you, we could, we will be able to aggregate to blocks and counties and zip codes. So once we're there, I think we can also then start doing these more holistic sort of analytics between and getting into this hedonic pricing and and you know finding out how how hazards are playing into this and then hopefully figuring out how to inject hazards if they're not playing a big enough role in the in the value of homes or the pricing of homes so chris that question has and makes me already see in my mind one of our colleagues uh two of our colleagues who are legally trained and they have uh, told us right at the onset of our project that any disclaimer you're going to add to the website, you might end up in some, you know, legal hot waters down the road. And I could already see him. If we propose to include this in our website, his hair is going to be on fire, which it already was when we, you know, suggest, said we want to show how risky a place may or may not be. And I think this would take this even a step further because us would we would then be saying, okay, this is the impact of your home value. So I think collective blood pressure would go up significantly with our within our team. No question. So it's interesting now. We have this conversation often. Is just if this website didn't exist, guess what would still be happening? Hazard losses. So just because we're democratizing this scarce and fugitive hazard data in a way that's meaningful doesn't mean that we're influencing hazards uh, happening. They're, they're still happening. So I agree, Mel, There's, it's tricky. Fortunately, we're in the university. So we have great lawyers who love to think <laughs> about, about, about intellectual property and you know, uh, public good and all of that stuff. Um, but I agree, there's, you know, it's a, are we, are we more, more marginalizing those people that are already marginalized um, by providing this data? Are the, are the people, in the end, holding the hot potato going to be those that can least afford to hold the hot potato. So uh, certainly, all these questions are very concerning. So can I follow up with, with maybe a question on that? And, and maybe for Chris and Melanie, can you talk a little bit about what we've been doing in theme one, um, which is really looking at um, sort of public perception of the value of mitigation? Because I think that's something that we didn't really cover in, in the presentation today. So, okay, let me start. And I see Chris already took off his video. So let's see if he's going to come back in. So one part of our research project that we, as Carol said, did not highlight or showcase here at all was a group of, I want to say maybe majority economists who conducted um, surveys. And I think our end was greater than a thousand uh, for this study where uh, they looked at and they uh, included um, 
I forgot. What is the term, Carol? It's not multiple choice. Uh, there's a term, an approach economists use. Ah, I forgot. Where you can, they, the survey a participant got different options and they selected them. Do I prefer this home over that home? Based on the information that was shared uh, in the survey. And we found, I think, some very, very interesting results where an end user's tolerance to risk not only depended on the actual, for instance, flood risk there, it was solely focused on flood risk, but also on how this information is depicted. And we saw that when the information was, I want to say, shared in a very, in a less detailed way, more in a generic risk information, users had a tendency to buy the higher risk property. Mm -hmm. But when they had more detailed information, their risk tolerance reduced and they were not willing to buy that property. So and a home buyer's understanding of you know, how much risk the property is faced with is not just the scientific information of probabilities and losses, but it also depends on how this information is communicated. And I think that might be sort of a, a feedback loop that is hard to break. And I also think it's difficult scientifically to, to study. And this is something where going forward, we wanna see you know, now that we've developed this application, can we leverage this application now to test some of these hypotheses and understandings of how people interpret this information and which choice would they actually make? Great discussion. Um, next question is from ICLR's Executive Director, Paul Kovacs, who says, wonderful initiative. What has been done to compare the predicted losses with actual losses experience? So I'll go ahead and take that question. Um, and thank you for that question, Paul. Um, the average annual loss method that I presented first is all based on historic losses. So those are on actual losses that have occurred. And what we do is simply weight those losses by the occurrence of the hazard and by the population. So we're uh, aggregating more losses into the higher population centers that have had more of those events in the past, um, essentially giving the probability and the population the weighting that aggregates it into the different census blocks. So the information on those first six hazards I presented is all actual information. In terms of the wind and flood hazards, um, right now those are just predicted. Um, and so that's a really good comment, I think. Um, one of the issues that I think exists, and maybe it's more so for uh, the flood hazards, is um, it's really difficult to get a, a good period of history that has experienced the level of flood hazard that we are experiencing now. And especially a lot of these Gulf Coast communities are have, have been in a stage of rapid development over the you know the past several decades. And so really looking at, at flood information and where floods have impacted, I think you know, we're seeing a change in the spatial distribution of those hazards, more impervious, impervious surfaces, more runoff, uh, greater flood levels. And so even suggesting that the flood maps, which, is based, which are based on a lot of modeling are correct, I think is you know, maybe not responsible necessarily, but to have that history of of actual losses across the study area is not something that we really tried to um, to achieve, and so I think um, that's something over time we'll need to do. Maybe from a wind perspective, um, that would be more achievable just because of the the history of the wind hazards that we've had. Um, but I appreciate that question. And I think Carol, one could probably say that I think we are very conservative in our estimates because we do a lot of aggregating but then also disaggregating across different properties so if we had access to property level truly like insurance claims and had information and property by property loss information over the past mm -hmm. i would venture to guess 
that the individual level property losses are higher than what we are showing on the website because it's all averaged information. But as many of you are probably familiar with, this information does not exist or is accessible to the general public. Great, thanks. Um, we have a question in the uh, in the chat. Um, uh, attendees, please put your questions in the Q and A box. This is just too many dialogue boxes to keep track of. But uh, Roberto Figueroa um, uh, compliments you. He says, "Excellent work. Any plans to uh, factor climate change scenarios into the hazard frequency and intensity, considering that people will live uh, many years in those homes?" So I can talk a little bit about that. One of the analyses that was led by Thomas Wall at University of Central Florida did look at the coastal flood hazard and considering sea level change scenarios, how many years it would take for properties that are perhaps in the X zone to be into like the coastal high hazard area, looking at what the projected coastline changes might look like and how many years um, those shorelines have until they are exposed to what we think would be the, the greater hazard regime of those high hazard events. Um, in terms of the average annual loss for the six hazards that we talked about, um, this methodology was actually first developed for the state of Louisiana hazard mitigation plan. And so when we wrote those papers and did that analysis, we did include future changes in climate in terms of, um, I guess, you know, intensification of some of those hazards. And so that's a, a potential that we could do in this last year of the project, um, looking at the, the wind and the flood hazards. Um, I think that becomes a little bit more complicated on the flood side, but I think we could look at some, you know, projected intensification of, of the wind hazard data. Um, but I think, you know, that's really something that is important that we have have talked about and we want to do, but it's a matter of of how to present it. It's a little bit information overload. And, and we do understand information that's provided based on data of today really is data, you know, and information from the past. And so how can we include some of those future conditions? Great. Thanks. Um... Uh, Cindy uh, Seyfried asks, have you thought about a partnership with the insurance industry so that you could access real claims? And I think you just uh, you, you already addressed this question. Uh, any um, uh, so you can have access to real claims data. I think that was what what you were suggesting a little. Uh, I mean, we would love to. No, no doubt about it. We would love to, to really see, you know, because I think this is now. As Chris mentioned, we have we are now interested in sort of building out this community piece of the website that doesn't exist for planners and stakeholders. But obviously, we also have, I think, a lot of work ahead of us to really validate and verify what we've created to see, you know, how good or bad or how far off our estimates and assessments are. So I think this is really for us, you know, endless future work ahead. But I also want to share something that was in, it was an interesting comment that we got back from um, user our website or we, we wrote a piece for the conversation where we highlighted uh, the tool and one of the comments that we got back was or maybe it was less a comment than somebody's personal interpretation they thought this was an application funded by the insurance industry and I think this is a really sort of it speaks to this attitude of you know who wants to share or know the risk or the resilience information tied to their property something that chris alluded to earlier about winners and losers because there is obviously a great reluctance of people who maybe based on past experience or subconsciously know that they have a high risk and it could possibly devalue their property if it would truly be factored into their home pricing and I think this opens a whole other sort of discussion of having this information available. Chris alluded to who will be able to use this information and what way will people be able to use this information and who doesn't want this information to be out there. And this is what we've constantly been doing. You know, there's this inherent risk that always existed and just gets hand over, handed over from property owner to property owner without true and full disclosure. 
Right. Um, Chris Chopik, before I get to your second question, I'm going to ask one of my own. Um, tell us about uptake by the public, by real estate professionals and real estate websites and by government of this tool. So the tool, and Chris might expand on this, we first launched this in March. So it's not been out for too long. And so this is something now where we need to get a little bit more upfront and out front to see how we can use and leverage this tool. And this is also where this idea for the API is coming in that other sites are able to use and leverage the information that we have. But we have not done any tracking or partnerships yet like with real estate agents. This is for instance, something where we could see a, a great research project aside from just you know application partnering with real estate agents and then see you know if they share this information or if they don't share this information what possible decisions are made by an end user okay thanks uh chris chopik's second question is um additionally along with build back better advice chris chopik was the one who asked uh, whether you had looked into the effect on um resale value Additionally, along with build back better advice, is there any consideration for relocation messaging? Carol, do you, I can, I could already see Carol smirk. Do you want to maybe uh, take this? Because in Louisiana, this is a hot topic, I would say. I was thinking you could provide a more politically correct response, but <laughs> you know, um, relocation is a really sensitive topic and especially you know, in, in Louisiana, uh, we look at Louisiana, I can't remember what number I heard, but that, you know, how much of the nation's watersheds are we draining? Um, how much at risk are we for flooding? And yet the importance of, for example, uh, the uh, Mississippi River outlet and uh, the amount of trade and commerce that really rely on Louisiana being functioning and, and running. And so, um, a lot of times when we start talking about relocation, people are, are very sensitive about that. And I think another thing that I've really seen over the past you know, 20 years that I've been working in the, the area of hazards is, is every place is subject to hazards. Uh, if you look at the floods in you know, Montana last year, uh, you know, floods in North Dakota, uh, droughts in in the Midwest, uh, wildfires in California, and and really, if if we're going to start doing messaging on relocation, then where is the safe place to go? Because all all of our landscapes are fraught with hazards, and I think the the, the first line of defense, right? So that's kind of one of the the themes of our project is is keeping the houses intact, keeping them inhabitable so that people can decide if that is where they want to live their lives or if they want to be somewhere else. And, and certainly as uh, climate change and other factors make areas unable to be inhabited, then I think those decisions need to be made. But we have the technology, you know, we know how to resist these wind loads we know how to avoid the, the flood, the flood hazards um, from, for, for the majority, I think, of, of the damage and the losses that we're, we continue to see year after year after year after year. Um, it's the same thing over and over. One of the, I think, silver linings of, of Hurricane Ian is that was the same path that Hurricane Charlie had taken in 2004. And from a wind perspective, the, the buildings fared much better than they did in Charlie. Charlie was, you know, about the same intensity, but a much uh, smaller eye wall. Um, but really looking at footage from the Charlie uh, storm to Hurricane Ian, I think from a wind damage perspective, they did much better, but it was really a, a kind of a catastrophic surge event for, for many people. And so, um, you know, I think understanding what, maybe those change conditions along the coasts are and trying to, to design for those? Or do we really say, you know, people shouldn't be living along the coasts? Businesses should not be operating along the coast. I don't know if anyone has the political will really to get that done at this point, but um, I, think, I think really more study is needed to be able to look at the areas, 
you know, maybe that are truly safer. So are there areas of the of the country or the, you know, North American continent that, that really are safer? We should be developing those areas as more, you know, refuge areas for, for people who are experiencing these hazards over and over. But that's that's my best response on that. Thanks. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks a question related to one that you've already answered. Sorry, I might have missed uh, if you already answered this. Uh, did you validate the information of the actual outcome from the current hurricanes? And uh, um, although you did take a stab at something like this, uh, it's relevant because Chris is on the Gulf Coast measuring, you know, uh, 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 you know, depths, uh, flood depths. Um, so are you, tell us about, you know, how, what are you doing right now with the recent uh, uh, hurricanes to, I don't know, interact with the, the modeling you've done here? Uh, so certainly I would love to be able to say that we have a team of hundreds of people and high, high performance computing clusters that could take the data that we're collecting right now in the field and have answers to these questions. That's where we need to be. Um, unfortunately, this, this project is really one of trying to situate people with information so that they can make better decisions moving forward. Um, so certainly we are collecting this data. Um, I tell you, USGS has been down here. They have the main mission for collecting high water marks. It takes the USGS, uh, sorry, US Geological Survey, about eight months to produce flood depths, right? Official flood depths. So there's honestly no way to sort of do real time does what you say uh, confirm with what you're seeing on the ground. However, that is certainly something that we do over and over again. And Carol can sort of jump in because we're using real historical loss data to determine these average annual losses. So uh, now the question then becomes, we need better data from insurance companies because we're using data that may be at a higher level of aggregation. So the more data we have, obviously, the, uh, to, to situate this and to, and to understand locally what's happening, the better. Um, I don't know if Carol wants to jump in. So I would. And I think this question of validation is, is very important. But I do think that we need to have these numbers in terms of the, you know, the average annual losses. And, you know, remember, we're using that as a measure of risk, not of loss. And so, you know, loss projections or loss modeling is often done for a particular event. And so you take the magnitude of that event and you might apply, you know, your wind damage functions or your, your depth damage functions for flood. And then you estimate how much loss you might have. So rather than that, we're looking at risk, which is the probability of the event occurring multiplied by the consequences of that event summed over all probable events. And so the higher probability events, you know, the 100 year flood, they actually contribute much more to the risk because the probability is so high, right? So even though the losses are lower, um, one of the statistics people often say is that one inch of water costs $25,000. But if you think about it, you know, if you have one inch of water in your house every five years, that's going to add up to a lot of money versus maybe the 500 or the 1000 year flood is going to completely destroy the house. But the probability of it occurring is, is one over, you know, 500.2% annual probability of occurrence. And so when we look at the risk calculation, I think it really takes on a different meaning and a different understanding. Um, one thing I would like to point out from that perspective of risk is that we are assuming that, for example, the, the flood maps, uh, FEMA's flood maps that delineate the 100 year event or the um, ASCE 7 uh, wind speed maps are correct. But when I look at, um, for example, Sanibel Island, the risk category two wind speed for ASCE 7 2016 is 161 miles per hour. Um, and if you recall, Hurricane Charlie was in 2004, they had similar wind speeds and it was around 160 miles per hour. We're talking about three second gusts. So in a span of 18 years, we had two events that is the same wind speed as the 700 year mean recurrence interval event, which then leads me to believe 
that the map is not correct, right? Or we're seeing these intensification of hazards because this is a once in a 700 year event and we had it happen twice in 18 years. So the probabilities are not working out. I think one of the other issues is that, you know, people don't really understand probabilities. You can't have this kind of conversation with, with most people because that's just a number. But when you put in the losses and you're calculating what the losses should be and you're comparing them, for example, over time, and maybe that's a good exercise, Melanie, we should think about doing is looking at those Sheldis losses and looking at the losses that we're projecting. And if the Sheldis losses are a lot higher, then that means that there is a problem with the underlying probability maps, which you can never really understand until you compare the actual numbers over a long period of time. Um. Uh, and for uh, thank you very much for for the audience's uh, uh, information. ASCE seven is a document by the American Society of Civil Engineers that um, provides some design parameters, like design for this level of wind speed. So when Carol mentioned seven hundred year wind speeds, it says you know there's a, there's a map in in that document that says here is the peak gust velocity that happens at this location on average once every um, 700 years. Um, Chris Chopik uh, had a third question. Lastly, how is retrofit weighted against uh, IBC 2015? That's the International Building Code, the 2015 edition of the International Building Code, uh, which is the United States is equivalent of the National Building Code in Canada. Anyway, how is retrofit weighted against IBC 2015? Retrofitting an older home can create a stronger, more resilient home and retains embodied uh, carbon and capital. How is that captured and valued? So as I mentioned earlier, we do not have that information readily available from the Zillow data, from ZTrex data. So this is something where we would actually need to know this information from the end user. They would have to tell us, you know, when was it, for instance, retrofitted? And then we could possibly, or we would love to, integrate it into our final score. But we don't have that information. And this is something where we have all this room for improvement now going forward. How do we integrate user-provided information into the score, into the other information that we, that we share on the website? But short answer, it's not included yet. Great. Uh, we have no other questions from the uh, from the audience. Um, but Carol, I want to I want to provide some feedback on the, the the point that you just made that uh, a moment ago that um, you know when you get two seven hundred year you know wind speeds in the same place within a short period of time, um, do you really think that that means that the uh, uh, that the estimation of 700 year wind speed is wrong. I mean, my thought is that clumping is natural in a stochastic process. You would not expect them to be spread out. I mean, it would be unusual if uh, if 700 year wind speeds, uh, you know, came in every 700 years. You would it would be much more natural to see them to see multiple, you know, 100 year, 500 year wind speeds happening very close together rather than, uh, than far apart. And one would have, I think one would have to average over all, you know, you'd have to apply the theorem of total probability and average over the entire map to find out if there's something systematically wrong with the map, just because two loca one location had uh, very rare uh, events uh, back to back, or maybe you had something deeper, or maybe you thought about this in a way that you haven't had, you know, that I'm missing. I, Keith, I appreciate that. And I probably oversimplified. Um, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about is, for example, you know, Houston, they have a 500 year flood every couple of years, or even every year sometimes. Um, and I, I do think we need to understand um, some of the, the location differences, right? So just because it's in Houston doesn't mean that that particular period or portion of Houston has been subjected to that 500 year flood. Um, but at the same time, when we're looking at, you know, integrating these loss functions by probability, uh, really according to the math, we should not be seeing these flood depths that are, you know, five, six, seven feet into the house. 
And many times we have houses that are completely inundated uh, well above the rooftops. And from a probabilistic perspective, it's really, it's too high. And when it happens again in the same place to the same level, it really makes me question, you know, the, the maps and the probabilities um, with the wind, I don't have as, as much experience. So, you know, maybe I, I misspoke, um, but I think uh, we can take a look at some of the, the historic records and um, really maybe get a better understanding of um, some of the like occurrence probabilities. But I think that the consequences now, you know, are becoming much more severe because of the additional development along these coastlines. And it, it may be that there isn't an underlying issue, you know, with, with the maps themselves, maybe for a period of 2000 years, there was never a storm that went up that way uh, to that intensity, which then, you know, helps average out. But um, in, in my opinion, when we have the loss data, when we have the projected losses, we can then compare and over a, over a long time scale, right? So not just you know for today, but also then uh, going in and, and weighting some of the losses from the past according to the the settlement patterns of today and the uh, the exposure characteristics that we have today, which I think helps to understand really um, are we on track with reducing losses or are we uh, on track with you know escalating those losses. And let me just tag in there, like what I'm seeing. So it's not all bad news. Like we are learning as a society to build on a hill, right? And just to give you a case in point, in Cape Coral, the same neighborhood, houses built in the 60s were flooded two to three, four feet. Houses built in the late 80s were flooded two or three, four inches. Houses built in the 2010, 2010s and 11 didn't get flooded, right? So we are learning. So I think what Carol will always tell you is in, in Florida, we have a building code in 2020 that's based off of 2018 international. So we're already four years behind. So take what the building code says and go above that two, three, two feet, three feet, four feet. Like let's learn that building codes are automatically outdated and let's just build more resiliently because if we can keep people in homes, keep home, homes protected, we avoid a whole bunch of losses. I think that's a great message. Um, Cindy Seyfried asks, have you thought about getting information from local governments for upgrades and retrofits? So access to building permits, for instance, would be a great data source to integrate in our application. But so we definitely considered this and explored this idea because we also have experience some of us especially Chris experience with working with building permits and how readily or not accessible they are so some communities some jurisdictions have that available digitally and others don't so for us you know this is a question operationally for the application does it make sense for us to include data in some places but not in others so how good or bad of an outcome does that generate or how, you know, how valid is our result when we can only do it for some areas versus not others. So this is more of an operational question than really, you know, can we do it? Yes, we could. And it would be great if, we, if this data was available, you know, in a database that we could just tap into, but it's not. Right. The same thing with uh, like uh, first floor elevations. There are some data sets out there, but they're not comprehensive. Um, in three counties in Mississippi, three coastal counties in Mississippi, there are 22 different municipalities that we'd have to go to if we were going to collect this information and indeed if they had programs. The state of Florida, for example, has a program on wind mitigation. So we could include that, but maybe the state of Louisiana doesn't have the same thing. So certainly all of this information would plus up what we know and provide a better answer. Um, we are really struggling with, well, this is a small grant, right? So we, there's companies out there that can provide us this aggregated building permit information at 80 or $90,000 a year that we don't have, right? So insurance companies, we're looking for sponsorship. Uh, you know, all of this stuff, we will ingest it if it can be made available to us. And we are happy to figure out how to do that the right way to come up with a better solution for society. Great, thank you. 
So we've got about uh, five minutes left, um, and I want to take the last, the, the final 60 seconds to uh, remind people about uh, next month's Friday Forum. So in the next four minutes, do you have any final remarks, any, you know, uh, uh, final takeaway you want our audience to leave with? Chris is, yes, please, Chris. He, he's our one-liner man. Uh, so I, we are looking for partners and it doesn't have to be money, right? We are looking for brain partners. We are looking for people that have data. We're looking for anyone that wants to make society better, to build resilience. This is really what it's about. So if you found anything here that you thought, oh, wow, yeah, what I have could it help, uh, you know, augment this, make it better. So certainly we are trying to grow the science as much as we're trying to grow the outputs. So anyone that wants to play, we have a big sandbox. Um, we only have 196 counties in the southeastern United States. So we have to grow to the rest of the US. And guess what? We have a great northern neighbor up here that <laughs> is facing similar things. You know, we need to know and build resilience everywhere uh, for the, you know, especially for thinking about climate sensitive hazards. So certainly look us up, get in contact, and I'll pitch it to Mel and Carol for some other ideas. So I would just say that a lot of what we really tried to do in this project is develop access to information that normally doesn't exist to people who normally can't understand how you get or, or display this type of information. Um, I think with the, the flood loss data, you know, Chris, that was something that took us a very long time. And Chris is saying, Carol, where's it at? And I said, Chris, we're doing something that's impossible, right? Nobody has this building level information on flood risk. No one has developed a method to, to do this. And then, um, but we believe this is a valid approach. And I think one of the, the great things is, is we're, we're publishing all of the methods behind this. And so um, not only is it the, the hazard aware study area, the hazard aware tool, but these methods can be used in other areas and um, you know, bringing these solutions to people who need the information. Melanie, any last? I tried to avoid this, Keith, because I thought Chris and, and Carol already provided such great comments. I think I just want to maybe hark back to the title of our project, which is called, you know, the first line of defense. And the reason why we call this, so to some, this, this line might sound familiar because in the US, the Federal Emergency Management Agency calls insurance the first line of defense. And we think that is really not accurate because who wants to go to an event, through an event, to then claim insurance? You don't want to go through the event in the first place. So I think more resilient construction, more resilient homes is really the way we need to go, not on having to pay more or higher insurance premiums and payouts. So I think the first line of defense is everybody's home, and that includes renters and homeowners. Couldn't agree more. Um, all right. So with, with that, I want to uh, thank you, Melanie, Carol, Chris, for taking the time to speak with us today. Uh, I wanna to congratulate you on this wonderful tool. I think it's gonna be uh, hugely valuable. Um, and with that, I'm going to conclude today's uh, Friday Forum and simply remind you um, uh, about next month's Friday Forum on November 18th. Uh, Julius Gombos will tell us about nature-based flood protection on Toronto's waterfront. Please watch your inboxes for an announcement and a reminder of the, uh, the URL to, um, uh, to log in on. Uh, so uh, thank you all very much and uh, have a great weekend. Bye-bye, everyone.